Good evening. And since this is the first sky at night of 1985, let me wish you a very happy, if somewhat belated, New Year. The newsletter's ready, and I'll give you the address at the end of the programme, as usual. But first, let me start with something very topical. This is the year of Halley's Comet, which is now approaching the sun. And I thought you might like to see the latest photograph of it, taken this time with the INT, or Isaac Newton Telescope, uh, in La Palma. And there it is. It was taken with an electronic device, of course, which is why the stars appear as those blobs. That arrow indicates the direction of motion of the comet, and the two guidelines show you where the comet is. Frankly, it doesn't appear very spectacular, and at the moment, it's still very faint indeed. I can't yet see it with my telescope. I don't think I will do before the early summer. But it is drawing in, and there are indications it's uh, rather brighter than we thought it might be. I'm not going to say it's going to be spectacular, because, frankly, it's not. But with any luck, we'll see it with the naked eye around about next December, and uh, we should get some very inform interesting information from it, particularly as uh, several probes are going to go past it, and one, the Giotto probe, is going to go right into the heart of the comet. Of that, very much more and on, I'll have a great deal to say about Halley's Comet over the year. I've had a great many letters about that very brilliant thing visible in the western sky after sunset, and that is the planet Venus very much the brightest of all the planets, and named in honour of the goddess of beauty. And it really is a lovely object when seen with the naked eye. Telescopically, it tends to be a bit of a disappointment. That is a drawing I made of it a few evenings ago, and you can see there that the phase is just over half. Obviously, Venus has no light of its own, shines only by reflected sunlight, and therefore, everything depends upon how much of the sunlit side is turned towards us. And over the next few weeks, the crescent will become narrower and narrower until finally we'll lose sight of Venus altogether for a bit, near the end of March, after which it will reappear in the morning sky. But no telescope will show very much on Venus because it's covered with a dense, cloudy atmosphere and we simply can't see through it. And all you can see are very vague streaking markings that indicate cloud formations. Of the other planets, uh, Mars is on view, and if you find Venus and then look higher up and to the left, you'll see Mars as a fairly bright reddish star. There's a long way away from us now, and no telescope will show very much on it. The giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are pretty well out of view. Uh, during March, you'll have a good chance to see the little planet Mercury in the evening sky after sunset, but uh, you can't see it yet a while. So let's turn now to the stars. And in the east, everything's dominated by that magnificent constellation of Orion. I think nearly everyone knows how to find Orion. With its two leaders, the orange-red supergiant Betelgeuse and the brilliant white Rigel. And Rigel is a real cosmic searchlight, something like 60,000 times brighter than the sun, and so far away that its light takes at least 900 years to reach us. If you follow the line of Orion's belt downwards, you will come to Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the sky. And you'll note also that Sirius is twinkling quite violently. Not because it really is. Twinkling is due entirely to the Earth's atmosphere, but Sirius is so bright and from here rather low down and so it twinkles very obviously. Then we have Procyon in the little dog and then the twins, Castor and Pollux in Gemini. And if you look at those two, you will see that Pollux is rather the brighter. Uh, in the old days, if we believe the ancient astronomers, uh, Castor used to be the brighter. So either Pollux has brightened up or Castor has faded down, or else they've been misinterpreted, which, frankly, I think is the most likely explanation. And the rest of Gemini uh, consists of long lines of stars spreading out towards Orion, and is crossed by the Milky Way. So it's a lovely area, and if you've got binoculars, then sweep around and you'll see many glorious star fields. Almost overhead, there's the bright yellow star Capella, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Follow up the line of Orion's belt, and you will come to Aldebaran in Taurus, which again is a bright red star. And further out still, you will come to the lovely star cluster of the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, the loveliest open cluster in the sky. And it's rather interesting to see how many stars you can see without optical aid. Uh, average sighted people can see at least seven. Now, I mentioned Capella, which is almost overhead at the moment. It's a yellow star, or rather a pair of yellow stars, because it's a spectroscopic binary made up of two components so close together that with ordinary telescopes they appear as one. Now, Capella at the moment is nearly at the zenith. It so happens that Capella and the pole star and the brilliant blue star Vega lie almost in a straight line and about opposite distances from the pole. So when Capella's high up, Vega is low down and vice versa. And if you see a bright star straight above you, in winter evenings it's Capella and in summer evenings it's Vega. Well, at the moment, Vega is low down. It doesn't actually set from Britain, but it almost grazes the northern horizon and during evenings at the moment, I don't think you'll see it. Therefore, why am I talking about it? 
And the answer is because, quite recently, Vega gave us some very interesting information indeed, and we did a special programme about it at the time, as you may remember. And this was concerned with research carried out from IRS, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And there's a picture of it. And that was launched in January 1983, and uh, continued operating for most of the year. It mapped into red sources in the sky. It made some interesting discoveries in the solar system. Several comets, and a long, dusty tail from a known comet, and a curious little asteroid, or minor planet, which actually goes within nine million miles of the sun, closer than any other. But to my mind, one of the most interesting things it found was the fact that some stars, Earth, the Vega being the first, are associated with material which is so cool it doesn't actually send out visible light, but it can be detected in infrared. So Vega was associated with a huge infrared ex uh, excess, which was quite unexpected, and that could indicate planet-forming material. Well, when this was discovered, uh, other stars were examined also. One was Fomalhaut in the southern fish, and that also had an infrared excess. And by now, we know that some 40 stars have got the same kind of thing, uh, and if they have, well, there's no reason why they shouldn't have planetary systems. We believe that a planetary system is formed from a, a, an envelope of dust and gas surrounding a star in the fairly early stages of its formation, and the planets gradually build up by accretion. And the planets in our own solar system did that, and we know that the Earth is more than four and a half thousand million years old. But the point is that the Sun is a perfectly ordinary star. And uh, if we have planets, then why shouldn't other stars also? And the case of Vega and these other stars with infrared excesses seem to indicate that they actually do. Now, the trouble is, we can't see them. Because remember, a planet has no light of its own. It shines only by reflecting the light of a star, in our case, of course, the sun. And therefore, it's very difficult to see, except when it's close to us. We can see the members of our own solar system. But just imagine what would happen if you went so far out that the sun appeared only as a speck of light. Now, the sun is very much larger than the Earth. Let's have a look at the two uh, in scale. And that represents the sun. And that little white dot to the upper right represents the Earth to the same scale. And you can see how small the Earth is. And even the largest planet in the solar system, which by a long way is Jupiter, is still very much smaller than the Sun. So quite clearly, there's no chance at all of seeing a planet of another star with any telescope yet built. I suppose there's going to be a certain amount of chance with the Hubble telescope. That's now being prepared. And that's going to be launched into space. There's going to be a 94-inch reflector, and that's going to go around the Earth, above the top of the atmosphere. So seeing conditions will be ideal all the time. And there's a chance, I suppose, it may be able to detect a large planets going around nearby stars. But I certainly wouldn't bank on it, and there's no chance at all of detecting a planet of another star if that planet is no larger than the Earth. But there are other ways. And the recent evidence has come from a star that you've probably never seen, because it never rises here, and it's called Beta Pictoris. So first of all, let's see where Beta Pictoris is. Begin with Orion, as usual, and there is Sirius, the dog star, which, as I've said, is always rather low down, as seen from here, because it's south of the celestial equator. Now, if you could follow the line of Orion downwards like this, you will cross the boundary of the horizon as seen from Britain, and that's indicated by the dashed horizontal line there. So anything below that line doesn't rise. And finally, you come to a, a star called Canopus, which is the second brightest star in the sky. It doesn't look as bright as Sirius, not very far off, but in fact, it's very much more luminous and very much more remote. It's so far away that no one's quite sure how luminous it is. One estimate says it's about 200,000 sun power. Well, that may be an overestimate, but certainly Canopus is very powerful indeed, and if it were as close to us as Sirius, only eight and a half light years, uh, it would cast shadows. But I'm not going to talk about Canopus anymore. Close to Canopus is this star called Beta Pictoris which gives every impression of being a very run-of-the-mill star, and before recently, no one had paid a great deal of attention to it. It's about 78 light-years away, its surface is rather hotter than the sun's, and its luminosity is something like 50 to 60 times that of the sun, so it's a rather more energetic star than ours. But it was one of those stars which IRS found to have an infrared excess, a rather large one, so it did seem that there might be planet-forming material there. And it occurred to two American astronomers, Bradford Smith and Richard Tyrrell, to have a look optically and just see what they could find. And for this, they used a big telescope in Chile, the, observ the, the observatory of Las Campanas. Now, there's an overall view of the Las Campanas observatory. Unfortunately, I've never been there myself. I hope to go one way. I haven't seen it yet. But conditions in Chile are exceptionally good, 
And of course, Chile is well south of the equator, and so therefore we get all the southern stars that you can't see from here. Uh, Las Campanas is in fact under the same management as the famous observatory at Mount Wilson in California, where they had the great 100-inch telescope, first set up in 1917. Now there's the Las Campanas dome, and that also contains a 100-inch reflector, which is the same size as the Mount Wilson one, there it is, only of course it's a modern instrument, whereas the Mount Wilson 100-inch is very old. Telescopes today are very much more powerful than they used to be. They're the same telescopes, but they are now used with electronic devices. And Smith and Terrell used an electronic device called a CCD, or charge coupled device, to have a long, hard look at Beta Pictoris. And that's a picture of a CCD. It doesn't look very impressive, but it most certainly is. And the CCD, an electronic piece of gadgetry, is far more sensitive than any photographic plate. And so when you use one of those with a big telescope, you can get amazing results. And when Smith and Terrell had a look at Beta Pictoris using that, they really had a shock. The results were quite staggering. And there is the picture. Uh, let me make it quite clear at the outset that those colors are not genuine. They are false colors, and they've been deliberately added to the picture to make it easier to interpret. But there is Beta Pictoris, and extending out from it on either side are wings of material. And in fact, we now know that there's a circumstellar disk there, extending out to something like 48,000 million miles. And note that it seems to thin out when you get close to the star itself, because this disk is almost edgewise onto us. And there is a very strong chance, I think, that that is made up of planet-forming material, and the paucity of material close to the star may indicate that the material there has already been swept up by orbiting planets. And so far as we can tell, the material is made up of things like ices and carbonates and silicates, and the disk itself is probably rather young. And if we could go close to Beta Pictoris, I wonder, it could well be a scene rather like this. This, of course, is an artist's impression. It is drawn from the best evidence, and it could be very like that if we could only go and see. And if there really are planets going round Beta Pictoris, well, what about the chances of finding life there? Well, I've said that the Earth's an ordinary planet going round an ordinary star, and uh, if we live on an inhabited world, why should not other stars have planets of their own which are inhabited? And I see no reason why not. You know, all through history, Every time we've tried to set ourselves up on a pedestal, we've been rather rudely knocked off it. The sun's not unique, neither is the Earth, and therefore, why should we be? But we can't tell for certain, because we can't see these planets. And bear in mind also that Beta Pictoris is a more energetic star than the sun. And energetic stars run through their life stories very much more quickly. So the planetary system there, if it exists at all, as I think it does, uh, is younger than our own. And life is rather slow to evolve, and it may well be that even if there is a system of planets, then life may have not got going to the same extent it has here. But uh, who knows? And we've got, simply got to wait and see. But meanwhile, bear in mind again that Beta Pictoris also is a perfectly ordinary star. And if it and many others in our own part of the galaxy have got planetary systems, as it does seem likely now, then it may indicate they're common all over the universe. But we've got to be very careful about it. And there's been some talk recently uh, of another planet being discovered, which has turned out to be no planet at all. It's not a planet. And it's associated with a very faint star known as VB8. VB standing for the initials of the Dutch astronomer Van Beesbroek, who first drew attention to it a long time ago now. There's not a lot of point in my showing you just where it is. It's in the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, but uh, it's very faint, and you need a good star map and a powerful telescope to find it. And the companion that's caused all this interest is known as VB82. And it's never been seen directly, uh, which is why I can't show you an actual picture of it. We are dealing now once again with infrared, and this time the observations were made at the observatory of Kitt Peak in Arizona. And I have been there. Uh, it's a lovely observatory. It's now known as America's National Observatory, uh, and that's an overall view of it. We did, in fact, a program from there not so long ago, and at that stage, we concentrated on the main instrument, which is a big solar telescope, and there it is in the background, looking nothing like a telescope at all, frankly, but that's the most powerful solar telescope in the world. It's used for all manner of other observations. But the observations of VB8 and its strange companion were not made with that solar telescope. They were made with this, and this is a large reflector, actually larger than the reflector at Las Campanas. It's a big thing, one of the world's best, and of course, ultra-modern. And using this, uh, the astronomers there were able to establish that there is, in fact, an invisible companion to VB8. And they can even measure its diameter. It's about 80,000 miles in diameter. Now, that, of course, is comparable with our planet Jupiter. And if we have a look at the, the, the regular size, you'll see what I mean. 
There's Jupiter over to the left. There's VB8B, this strange thing. And there's the tiny Earth uh, over to the right-hand side. And also the distances are comparable with those in our solar system. And we can show that by means of a comparison. There's the Sun in the middle. Jupiter going around the Sun at a mean distance of 483 million miles and Saturn at 886 million. And if, in fact, we uh, imagine now that VB8 is in the center, then the companion will orbit at about uh, between the orbits of Jupiter and Saturn. But the point is this. It cannot be a planet. It's too massive. Because we can tell it's about 30 times as massive as Jupiter, and you cannot have a planet as massive as that. So this must be a star of some kind. And there is an essential difference between a planet and a star. Because a planet has no light of its own, and a star shines by its own luminosity. So let's for a moment consider a star like the Sun. Now the Sun's a big thing, as we've seen. You can throw a million Earths inside the Sun and still leave room to spare. And the surface temperature is not very far short of 6,000 degrees centigrade. And the inner temperature is very hot indeed, at least 14 million degrees, and it may be rather more than that. And it's in those inner regions where, new, where, where the material is being produced which keeps the Sun radiating. Uh, the Sun is made up very largely of hydrogen, which is the most plentiful uh, substance in the universe. And deep inside the Sun, the hydrogen atoms, or nuclei, are banding together to form atoms of helium. And every time uh, four hydrogen nuclei get together to make one nucleus of helium, a little energy is set free and a little mass is lost. It's that energy that keeps the Sun shining, and the mass loss is about four million tons a, a second, although I'm glad to say that um, there's plenty left, and the Sun won't change much for at least 5,000 million years in the future. But now consider just how a star is formed. It's thought that the star begins by condensing out of a nebula, cloud of dust and gas. As it shrinks under the effect of gravity, the inside heats up. And, and this is the point, when the critical temperature of about 10 million degrees is reached, then nuclear reactions begin and the star starts to shine, as the sun is doing now. But just suppose you have a star which is not so massive as that, not massive enough for the central temperature ever to reach 10 million degrees. What's going to happen? It will never start nuclear reactions at all, and it will become what's called a brown dwarf star, shining very feebly until it simply uh, all its light and heat leaves it. And that must be the case with VB82. It can't be a planet. You just cannot have a planet 30 times as massive as Jupiter. And so VB82 is, in fact, a brown dwarf star where nuclear reactions have never been triggered off at all. And if we could go to that system, I wonder what the scene would be. Might be very like that, I think. But the point is, you see, that brown dwarfs are almost certainly common in the universe, and they've been known as theoretical possibilities for a long time. And so have planetary systems. And uh, if we are right in this, then there's no reason at all why either the Earth or the sun should be regarded as abnormal. And there may be many brown dwarfs, like BB-82, and many planetary systems, which Peter Pictoris does give us, I think, a pretty good example. So on the whole, both BB-82 and Peter Pictoris, in their different ways, have made their contribution to scientific history. And in the coming years, I think we're gonna find out a great deal more. Now, before I go, I said I'd give you the address of the newsletter. Uh, so here it is again. Uh, newsletter number 16, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W12 8QT. And if you want one, you must send the stamped address envelope. We've got to ask you to do that, otherwise we simply couldn't cope. But we do send out thousands of newsletters every time, and I hope you find them useful. So for the moment, good night.